I'm here not to tell you what to do, really, but tell you what I've done with my bees and what I'm doing with my bees. And you, may, you might like some of it and you might not like some of it, but that, I'm just here to really tell you how I've gone about trying to sort my bees out and make them a bit better than they were. And that's what it's all about, really. Um, so basically, we're going to cover the current position of, bee, of our bees and beekeeping in this country. Uh, I'm going to suggest an alternative to importing, selecting from what we've got, which a lot of you probably do already. And the improvement process, natural and artificial selection, how we go about it, and putting it into practice, really. And that's what it's all about, ultimately, is the, pra the practical side of things. Of course, as soon as you get to one of these talks, everything starts becoming theoretical and a bit removed from what we're actually doing with our bees. In the summer, we're flat out with the bees, and, uh, and that's very real. But in the winter, we're talking about it and trying to make that a reality in next season. Anyway, let's start with looking at bee improvement. There's just a few random ideas here or, th or things to think about. Um, well, you might say, why bother? And shouldn't we leave, just leave it to the experts? I'm not going to answer that at the moment. Um, the importance of beekeeping, you all know about that. It's very important for food and agriculture. It's very important for the environment, for everything that depends on flowers and plants and so on, right up the food chain. Um, so we can't stress enough that, that you beekeepers and us beekeepers are doing something really important and uh, we've got to take it very seriously, in a way. Um, and perhaps we should be thinking about bee improvement on a national scale. It's relevant to all of us, I think, as beekeepers, because we want a hardy, sustainable population of bees, <coughs> and this is part of it. Everyone benefits from a hardy and productive honeybee. So, a lot of people think, well, this is certainly what I was told. Leave it to the experts when I started. This is me looking over Brother Adam's shoulder and trying to find out about his... This is a, his, the mating apiary on Dartmoor. Um, and it's fascinating to go along and see that in action. And his bees were very impressive and very, very nice and so on. Um, and that, that's fine. Uh, and I, this is what I started when I, when I started I was trying to bring in bees of various sorts and Buckfast was <coughs> quite near me so that seemed an, a good sort to try and I tried one or two other things as well the problem is that not only it's not just what I say it's what Brother Adam freely admitted the quality will go down after a while and he, that's fine his answer was well, we've got to do is bring in another queen at that point and rear lots of queens from her, and that bucks the standard up again. And this is the process you go through, keep bringing in new stuff. <coughs> but I wasn't very happy with that. Um, that doesn't quite ring true with me. Um, for a start, you get no local adaptation in your population. You're always having to bring something from outside. Um, and then recently, we've had the Colos report, um, which you know, uh, was what a lot of us have been saying for a long time, really. They found out the locally adapted bees fare better than imported ones. It's, it's fairly obvious to a lot of people, but it's nice to have it proved, scientifically proved. And, of course, a lot of what I say hasn't been scientifically proved, but as far as I'm concerned, I've proved it with, with um, my own bees, but I haven't got the scientific evidence, if you like. And, but... And this is what the Collis report said. The spread of imported genes into the local population may increase genetic diversity, but is not necessarily beneficial, as maladapted genes may contribute to colony losses. That's a long definition, but, all not, but it's, it makes sense to me. And uh, I don't think that's the answer. Imports, well, what's wrong with imports? There is a biosecurity risk associated with it. The healthy bee plan highlighted the problem of imports and DEFRA are keen to reduce imports. They're keen to reduce imports because it, it goes up year on year, as you're probably aware. Um, 
the only way to get round that probably is more queen rearing in the UK as an alternative. And I say <clears throat> it should be linked with a bee improvement programme. Then there's some incentive to having home reared. We can all be all be tuning into the same thing, and we've got a reason to buy locally produced queens, <coughs> not something from abroad which mucks up our improvement programme, really. <coughs> um, an improvement programme would encourage home-produced queens rather than imported ones. And I think we definitely need some encouragement because <coughs> nobody's got the answer as yet as to how we reduce imports. With less imports, our bees would have a chance to establish themselves and the best ones would get uh, would thrive and we'd have something to build, build a platform on. One of the things with bees is we're looking for some consistency. If you remember from maybe from school days, Gregor Mendel was in the, I think, 19th century looking at um, hereditary, the hereditary things, looking at peas and various things, plants and so on, and seeing how the parents related to the offspring. And he found when he bred from mi very mixed offspring, uh, parents, he got very mixed offspring. And he couldn't, con you know, there's no consistency within that population. And <clears throat> it's the same thing with bees. Um, and if you talk to any bee breeder from around the world, they'll say to you they like to breed within a single subspecies because it keeps a close-knit uh, population where the offspring resembles the parents. But fast bees, you could argue, were slightly different because Brother Adam's policy was actually to cross different uh, subspecies and he, he liked the hybrid vigour he got from that and people still do today, very popular bee um, and they perform well. Slight problem with them, once you've got, them, got the bees you cannot keep the strain going, <coughs> and I don't think, unless you keep bringing in more stock because they are hybrids. Um, Brother Random freely admitted that. <coughs> And uh, so I was looking for, is it possible to raise standards and get consistency in my stock, really? And can we develop a strain of bee that breeds true? And um, you know from this picture, these bees all look the same. They're not like most of our bees, which are quite mixed. If you look at the appearance of them, unless they've recently brought in a specific strain, you'll find your bees are all shapes and sizes, all, all different colours particularly. Um, these are dark abdomen and yellowy brown hair around the thorax is quite typical of a native bee. So what is a breeding strain? This is what I've been talking about and this was def can be defined again, getting into the realms of theory and not practice but a strain is a group of colonies which show uniform or fairly uniform characters and breed true to type and I think that's the crucial issue. Uh, the characters of the parent parents and offspring are generally similar. From that, you deduce we want to develop a strain that will breed true. Well, we're, we're not in a great position. Um, this was some work that was done um, mainly by Catherine Thompson at Leeds University a few years ago. And she analysed uh, bees from, that were taken from the uh, survey, what was it called? Uh, random bee survey that they're doing around England and Wales. And so it's not a UK average, actually, it's England and Wales average. But and this is what she reckoned she found by the DNA analysis. She found all these different things in them. Um, there's various strains of carniole and uh, various strains of ligurian and so on. And the, the green block is the, our native bee, uh, which surprisingly had a, quite a big proportion, even despite everything. So we've got a very mixed population. Um, hybridisation makes section improvement difficult, so that I decided, you know, this is where you can disagree or whatever, but this is what I did. I thought, well, that green portion looks good. I'd already started before I saw this map, actually, but it made sense to me to choose a strain that I thought would be able to get established. And so that's what I did, I went with the green block. But first, before I did that, even before I did that, I assessed colonies 
on for, for native native appearance. I know, assess them on their appearance on a grade of one to five, and uh, that's pretty rough and ready. But we'll see later on if it's any use or not. You can also do morphometry or DNA analysis to get to find out what your bees are. So what about the advantage of improving what we've got? And this is the theme, really, is improving the bees we've got and not having someone else's bees to, to take on. So we can develop a hardy and productive population, well suited to the local environment, and uh, it's something all beekeepers can do, plug into improving their own bees or their, their local bees. Better bees means less imports. Obviously, there are difficulties, and these are threats people think, well, that's impossible, because perhaps you've only got two or three colonies. Perhaps your neighbour is a regular importer of bees, and perhaps your bees are very hybridised and or poor quality. I say and or, because actually some hybrids are very good bees. They're extremely good performers, uh, good honey producers and so on. The snag with them is, as I said before, really, you try and breed from that one, and it doesn't give you anything very good. It, it, doesn't, it hasn't got any consistency to it. That's why I don't particularly like them. I've got nothing against their, their performance and so on. Some of them are great, some of them are terrible, just like everything else. So most of us belong to a local association, and the, the secret is, or one of the answers, if you've only got two or three colonies, even if you've got t 10 or 20 colonies, it's kind of a drop in the ocean in your particular area. So you can achieve greater influence by working with others. And that's a good key to things. So we should be trying to get things going in our local associations. Work with like-minded beekeepers. You know what beekeepers are like. Nobody agrees on anything. Uh, OK, work the ones that do agree. And don't worry about the ones that don't. Everyone is free to do what they want. But uh, keep a record of performance of all your colonies. And this allows you to choose the next generation to breed from. You can find your breeder queens. And that's the, one of the keys to it, really. Uh, queen rearing may be a group activity. But if the group is too demanding, it won't happen. Nobody's got the time for spending hours and days on someone else's project or a group project. We can all put in a little bit, but to make sure it's not too demanding. Some people will be able to put in more than others. At least you could go along with the general ethos of an improvement group and help where you can. And um, another point you could is try and identify an area around you that can be dominated with good drones. And uh, that really helps. And that's what I've tried to do around me. I'll show you in a moment. But the first, the starting point of any improvement, really, is, and this is where I started anyway, right, I'm not going to bring any more bees in. I've tried that of various different strains. I didn't get on very well. Very quick, even if they were good, very quickly I lost that, those qualities, and it didn't seem to be getting me anywhere. I wasn't happy with bringing in year after year, so I thought, right, I've got to start with my own bees. So where do I start? Well, for a start, if I lose half the bees or lose 10%, 20%, whatever I lose in the winter, the ones I've got left are great because they're, they've actually survived and that's the first quality you want. Natural selection is on our side. It helps us to uh, find a hardier bee which does well in our area. And it might be a different bee from my area to your area. We've all got slightly different conditions. So... It's helping with local adaptation. Which it's building up a locally adapted population, which, remember, the Colos report thought that was a great advantage. So local ad adaptation is when a population of organisms evolves to be more well-suited to its environment than other members of the same species. So we're gradually getting a population that's more in tune with our, our conditions. Colony losses contribute to this. We're losing colonies that aren't suited. We're, the genes that aren't suited are going out of the system. When you lose a load of bees, it's tempting to look somewhere else for more, to bring in, look aboard, buy in a bit more stock, <coughs> try and find something a bit better. But try and resist that. The surviving colonies are the best basis for a locally adapted population. 
and that's what you, gives you something to build on. In other words, we're working with nature and selecting for the survivors. Now, we can all do that, whatever type of bee we got. It's a really good starting point, and uh, there's no reason not to do it. Don't forget that natural selection is only one part of, <coughs> of the story, really, because nature selects for one thing, survival, basically, survival of the species, which is a brilliant start, I think, but it's not necessarily what the beekeeper wants. We might want a bit more, and, we, and that's where the artificial selection comes in. That's the selection by the beekeeper. So we're looking for some other qualities as well. Nature's a, a good help, but we'd perhaps want, you, you know, you, we all might want our own qualities, but most of us want good temper in our bees. We perhaps want low swarming. We might want good health, <coughs> good brood pattern, good overwintering and honey production. These are all qualities that I look for in my bees. Your version might be slightly different to mine. Although I, I, I was expecting people to perhaps vary a lot on this, but actually they vary surprisingly little. And so what we did was start keeping accurate records, one record for each colony of their performance, and it, it's very important, it's not too time consuming, it's got to be quick and easy to do, and you can give it a mark, I do most things, mark out of five, uh, so tempo, if you've got an extremely plastic colony that's absolutely delight to work with, you give it five when you go through it, give it five. And if you've got one that's perfectly reasonable to work with, but it's not quite as plastic, there's a bit more flying about, a bit more lively on the comb and so on, you'd give it four and so on. If they're absolutely horrendous, you give them one and so on. If they follow you out of the apiary, that's, you know, the, the bottom score. Um, and the, those are the ones we're trying to get away from. And if we know, and I never take it, it's not just one mark, you mark it every time you go through the colony because they vary on different days, as you know. If the weather's pretty horrendous, it's just about to pour rain. The bees are a bit on edge and uh, their temper's not likely to be so good. So you, you take an average of what's happening over the, over the weeks but you can pretty soon identify where the problems are coming from in your apiary. Sometimes in an apiary with perhaps eight, ten colonies, it's a bit hard to work out which one's causing the trouble, because as soon as one's up in arms, they're, they're, all, sort of, sort of, they're all reacting to it. But you can, you'll get a picture, and then this is what I did. I started to find out which ones were the troublemakers, because <clears throat> that was one of the first qualities I was looking for was good temper. This is where I am in Cornwall. Um, it's right by Plymouth. It's called the Rain Peninsula. And I'm quite lucky in some respects. We've all got to look for an area that suits us the best, but I'm lucky in that there's sea around there. I, I'm just in the middle of this lump. So it's, uh, it's quite a good area. At the time when I first started, I had most of the bees in the area. <laughs> there's a lot more beekeepers in the area now. Um, Luckily, most of them think along the same lines as me. They're quite happy to have bees like mine. Um, up this area, it's not that far away, but there are some other beekeepers who aren't sort of on the same wavelength as me. So we do get infiltration, and there's always problems, and you're never going to have a perfect situation. Everybody wants the perfect situation and the perfect bee, but it doesn't really happen. But as long as you're moving things in the right direction, you can get a lot of satisfaction from that. And that's what I do. I have setbacks all the time. Somebody brings in a colony that aren't the same strain as mine. It can really muck up matings. Luckily, you'll always get some good ones, which has kept me going. But you might get quite a few bad ones. And there we are. I started with a very mixed population. I assessed the temper on a one to five, and straight away I was wanting to weed out those bad ones. And it hasn't changed. They still do that today. Only it, they are better on average today. Most of them are good. And occasionally one gets thrown up that's not so good and then we, we deal with it quite soon. And I, I try and deal with it in the spring now because you know if it's bad in the spring it's going to be atrocious in the summer. They only get worse as they get bigger. So we keep things, keep on top of that. And I urge everyone to do the same. It's well worth it because it spoils the fun of your beekeeping if you've got a nasty colony. So we just propagated from the best, we re the worst, and on we went. 
and you'd be surprised how quickly you can make a difference and you can iron out problems in a season really and they might be a few cropping up again the following season but you iron them out and you keep working like that and it's one, probably one of the simplest things to sort out is the temper of the bee so they'll carry on with us a moment so we're in this position and we're trying to get something more homogeneous or at least that was I, what I suddenly realised. First of all, I was selecting just for temper, and I realised the bees are very uh, all sorts here, and their, their performance is varying tremendously. Um, what do people do in other animals, animal breeding? Well, they, they have pedigree animals. They know a Hereford cow is going to produce another Hereford cow, and so on. And they don't... Yes, the people do cross different breeds, but they have pure strains to work with to produce those crosses. And um, so I was trying to think, how do we get back to this more homogenous thing? So we're trying to strike a balance between diversity and inbreeding. You want something more homogenous, but you don't really want to lose that genetic diversity. That is crucial to any animal, is that you've got that genetic diversity. If a problem comes along, if they're all the same, identically, they're probably the whole lot will be wiped out. If you've got diversity, they've got strength in that and only a percentage will go down and the rest will be great. <clears throat> so this is a quote I quite like. But it doesn't, it's just a theory and it doesn't mean much, but it, it sort of points us in the right direction. A community of bees should be sufficiently outbred to be vigorous and disease-free, but sufficiently inbred to remain true to type. So we're trying to keep the same strain going, but we're keeping them as diverse as we can. Well, that's, that's my approach anyway. If we look at the situation in perhaps 1850, we had all these subspecies of honeybee around Europe, and we've been importing since then. And for, well, something I think is a good idea, but we've been importing since then. We're still importing. These are just the last few years how it's risen dramatically year on year. It's partly because of the demand for bees. Uh, there's a huge demand for bees because there's people coming into, the, into beekeeping all the time. They want a colony of bees. So what's the easiest way for the suppliers to make up a colony of bees? It's to buy in a queen and put some bees with it. And then you've got, got your nuke to sell. So that's fueling, partly fueling the import. And it's resulted in that, as you saw before, a bit of an all-sort situation. Now, I, w I decided that we need a strain of bee to go to, and I chose the native strain, which I thought would be easiest to establish. Um, your situation is not going to be the same as mine. You might have other ideas. But I, you can judge them on the appearance. You could do morphometry, which is a system of looking at certain veins in their wing. And that's, it's been worked out that you can identify different subspecies by looking at their wings, measuring veins in their wings and so on. Some people say it's not very reliable, but it's certainly some re reliable to some extent. Perhaps the most reliable is DNA analysis, which has got going in the last few years. Still very expensive. So most of us can't afford to go down that road. And I, being how I am, uh, I just want to be able to do it myself in an easy way. I like everything to be simple. Um, I mainly used method one, appearance. I mean, because the people have told me that's a bit rough and ready, that's not going to work. But we'll see later on if it works or not. Um, and so I just selected the most native to, to rear from, to propagate, the most native in appearance. And there were some bees around me which were pretty good in those terms. And I was quite surprised because I was told, you know, all the thinking at that time was native bees are extinct. There's no way you're going to find a native bee or even be able to... But since then, I've learned we've got perhaps an average of 45% genes in the population, which means there's going to be a lot of specimens which are higher, which means it's a good thing to start from. And I've been assured by the experts that you can breed back from a hybridised species back to a, back to a pure, more pure strain. And I've found that to be true. I hope people want to develop a strain from their local stock. It's certainly become uh, more accepted thinking now than ever before, probably. 
certainly when I started beekeeping, it was all, oh, where can we find some decent bees? We've got to buy this in, buy that in. And that was basically the thinking. But these days, people are more alert to the, the problem of imports, and they, are, they do want to select from local stock. And I think that's a very valid thing. Whatever way you go, I think that's a really good starting point. If you're going down the road of going for the native strain, you may, you may want to reinforce it by bringing in the odd bee of the same strain. But that's another story. And we're trying to get that strain established. I'll just run through this quickly to see how I went to try and identify mine. It may be relevant to some people. And this is, these are what I consider nice native bees. Uh, they're dark abdomens. They've got gingery brown or yellow brown fur or hairs on their thorax. And the body shape is quite broad, really. And there's some more hair. And if you get, a, if you, if you find a population, you look across the comb at the bees, and if they're all the same, like that, you know, you might have something worth breeding from there. It's only one aspect of the bee. They might be horrendous. They might, their qualities might be horrendous, but assuming they're not, you might have something that you could develop a strain from. Or you might find a colony where they're, they're very mixed. Some of them are dark like this, and some of them have yellow bands on their abdomen. Well, you can breed from that. And you can then start selecting the queens, which produce the most. Some will produce more native offspring, some will produce less, because there's variation in each generation. And this is one of the queens we bred. It's a nice dark one. Um, they're not all like this. Some of them are what I call dark banded. They have a, a band, a brownie band colored on. They don't look so nice, <laughs> in my opinion, but it's not about a niceness. Apparently, they're just as native. Uh, but if they look like that, then you know for sure <laughs> you're on something. Anyway, to go on to the qualities that I was looking for, we've already touched on. That one you don't have to do much, except not, not keep bringing in further bees. You've got your, your nature's helping you. And the, I, I'm a great believer in working with nature, not trying to fight it. And so that, that's a really great place to start. Uh, docility, we've talked about how we do that. And then it, I can develop my native strain by... I did it most of my parents. By the way, when I first did it, around about 1990, the <coughs> morphometry was coming in and we were being taught how to identify the subspecies of bees through morphometry. And I took a sample along and it, it, remarkably it came out really well, which was a real revelation because... As I say, we're told they don't exist, apart from maybe in remote parts of Scotland and Ireland. Um, anyway, since then we've had some DNA analysis. I'll show you some results in a while. Very keen on health, obviously. It's a crucial thing. I, my bees were pretty awful when I started. There was lot, lots of chalk brood in lots of the colonies. Um, it's one of the ongoing problems. Um, so you don't breed from those, because it may be linked to genetics, and some can cope with it more than others through hygiene methods and so on, I suppose. Um, I like a bee that comes through nice and solid after the winter. I mean, you, some come through really ragged and poor, perhaps about one comb big, and some will come through as a lovely solid nuke, which you know is going to expand as soon as conditions are right. And uh, it's lovely when they come through like that. And they vary in size. Uh, you know, up to a full brood box probably. And, but uh, so I do mark them in the spring as to how they've overwintered. And I also like to see a good brood pattern. Good brood pattern tells you a lot. At first I thought, well, brood pattern, surely it's just a cosmetic thing. And does it matter that much? But actually it tells you, it tells you the brood is healthy, if it's a good solid block of brood. It tells you there's no inbreeding going on, because inbreeding can give you a speckled brood pattern. Uh, chalk brood can give you a speckled brood pattern, and of course the foul broods. But, so a good solid brood pattern, you know all is looking pretty good. So I like to see that. And I, I do select my bees for being quite prolific, because um, one of the arguments against the native bee, people say, oh, they're just not prolific enough. I mean, they're, they're hopeless compared to a buckfast. 
but uh, I don't agree, and you can get quite a prolific strain going that gives you plenty of brood. Uh, don't say it's 10 combs of wall-to-wall brood, but do you really need that or want that? Anyway, low swarming is something else we go for. Um, if, a, if a queen that I've reared this season, if it goes through all next season without swarming, its first full season, I consider that a bonus and good and worth breeding from because that's what you want. If it swarms, a bee that swarms in its first season, not brilliant by any means uh, from a honey production point of view and from other points of view. So, and then I'm measuring the productivity and you can compare that to the average for the apiary really because every apiary is different. Some apiaries are, some apiaries in some areas are much better than others. Uh, so, my area, I would say, on the whole, is not brilliant for honey production, although it was good, very good this season. Last season, which was similar in a way, similar weather patterns, was pretty useless because it was hot, a bit hot and dry, hot and drier last year. So, with the heat, we, everything dried up and the nectar flow stopped very early. This year, it was close to perfect. We didn't quite get that heat, and the flow kept going, which was excellent yeah for for my area um i've always thought in the past the hotter the better but i've uh, found that's complete rubbish uh certainly in my area i mean it might be in some areas of good rich moisture retaining soils the heat probably helps but certainly where we are it dries out really quickly now some people say the key to bee improvement or breeding bees is the drone and that's all about the drone. You forget about everything else, just sort the drones out. Well, it's not quite like that, I don't think. I think the key to bee breeding or maintaining a strain is the breeder queens that you select. And I'll try and show you why. Because if you choose a nice breeder queen, you've kept your records, you've found that it's got all the qualities you want, and it's one of your own, it's even better. It's that even if it's not brilliant, it might be the best you've got. Uh, you want a good queen, and you've selected that breeder, and ideally you'll select more than one breeder because you want to keep that genetic diversity going. But all my queens are open mated, so they're mating with numerous drones of all whatever's in the area, so that keeps the genetic uh, diversity going. Anyway, from one breeder you can produce lots of daughter queens. And the good thing about these daughter queens, especially when you start, and you know, the bees in your area might be all different types. Well, you've found a type you like with your breeder queen, and you reared a lot of queens from it. And all those queens will mate with all these strange drones of different types. You think, oh God, I've lost it already. But you haven't, of course, because the drones that those queens produce will be fine, being from unfertilized eggs. And all the daughters of the breeder will put out good drones. And that's a crucial thing in bee improvement, and it can really help you. You might think, oh, it's hopeless. I've got a hopeless situation around me. No hope of getting anything better. But there is. If once you've got good, quite a few queens from a breeder queen, you're putting out good drones into, that, into your area, and it can change the whole thing, if not in one season, over several seasons, and you just have to keep repeating it. Uh, repeat year on year. Daughters of breeder queens produce plenty of good drones, and that's crucial to any improvement program. And there's a bit of a diagram here to try and help explain it. So you, you select your breeder queens, which will probably be maybe any number, however many of you are lucky enough to have good queens. They, those breeder queens might not be related, probably better if they're not, because it's keeping more diversity going. And you rear a lot of queens, they're the ones, your new queens. They will make with any old drone, but next year you f select a few more, some more breeder queens from your stock, rear a load more queens. Now these queens now will mate with the drones from your, your queens last year. So suddenly you're finding you're able to get a bit more consistency going. And if you keep repeating that year on year, the consistency builds up. And the problem never goes away. People get obsessed with having pure bees and a pure strain. You don't have to. I've never achieved it completely. 
you never will, I don't think. Someone will always be there to upset you. <laughs> and someone will bring in something else. And there's always a bit of a mixture. But luckily, hopefully, well, we've always been lucky to have some queens, each year some queens that are worth breeding from. And that keeps you going. So it's the same, same thing in the next year. And on it goes. Some years we have better luck than others. Some years we seem to have a monopoly on the drones and we're getting really good matings. Other years, oh, we've had a step back. Not quite as good this year. There's a lot more with uh, yellow offspring, for example. You know, it could be like that. But it doesn't matter. You pick the ones that are good and off you go again. And it's all about doing what's possible in your area rather than attempting the impossible. And it's got to be possible and easy. This is our queen rearing setup. We, we're using these hives, which I found much easier to use than Apideas and the German th things, the, the little points. They're a little bit bigger, six frames. We just put a strip of foundation in. Uh, and then when you first start, you're starting empty hives. You've got to put about a litre of bees in, in each one. And off they go and put a queen cell or a virgin queen in and let them mate. And then then they're quite a nice size. You can overwinter these easily. Uh, you can double the brood boxes up if you want, or even triple them up. I found they get a bit unstable if you... We, we don't usually triple them because they're, they're rather tall and thin. And they let, they've got to survive the winter like that. So we, we often double up for the winter. And then you, you're well away the next, in the spring because you... Uh, you've got stock already in a mating nuke, so it gets you off to a really good start. Um, and they're very easy to manage. They're more like a hive. If you look through that, you're much e it's much easier to find in the queen, strangely, than in a, a smaller hive, like an epidea, where they seem to hide away. I always have trouble finding the queen. She's always run into a corner or something, but on these, they stay on the comb more, and you, you can usually find her. So I recommend you try and Try and work with others, but try and get these what I call B improvement zones going. And you might not be lucky like me to have C around, mostly around you, but you might have other things that you can use. It might be the topography of the area, not great in the flatlands, but um, it might be there is some water around you. It might be an area, a big estate or something, where nobody's, got, you know, that someone owns but hasn't got any bees on or any colon, anybody with colonies on it, or it might be a nature reserve, something like that. Um, it might be a low population of people where there's hardly any beekeepers. And you've got to think about all these things and find, find a spot which will... It might not be immediately by your house. You might have to look around the area. But the, there's probably one area that's a bit better than another. And there may be mechanisms that favour... This is one another reason why I like the native bee, because I believe there are mechanisms which favour that strain. Because before we paid any attention to that strain, it still existed. I mean, I found a few good, fairly good colonies around my area. No one had selected them for donkey's years, if ever. They just existed. And I know there are other parts of Cornwall where they still exist. And don't say, well, there's none around me. There might not be. But when I go in various places in the summer, I always look. If you look on uh, something that bees are foraging on, and just see what colour the bees are. And you think, oh, that's a buckfast, that's a buckfast, that's a buck. Oh, hang on, that, that looks a bit more like a native bee. So at least there's some hint of... of uh, na I find there's a hint of native bees in virtually any area. I think native drones and queens mate in cooler conditions. That works in my favour, because I'm going for that strain. Um, I think there's something... A pre vicinity mating, they seem to mate quite local to their mating colonies. Uh, they don't necessarily form a drone congregation area on a lovely day, because um, we don't get that many lovely days normally. Uh, some seasons we go all summer without getting any nice days or any nice, con you know, consistently warm weather, and the bees still mate and, and you still get good queens. But who knows? But don't, no, I haven't proved anything. It's just the feeling I get because I get a lot of good matings with, within the strain. Um, so there we are. That's what uh, I've got. Several of these apiaries like this uh, in this area, 
And I've got bees um, going right out, sort of around a much bigger area. But I, this is kind of my mating zone. And I know it should be probably at least six miles uh, radius, in theory. Well, it probably isn't that. It's more like three or four that I keep pretty good. I'm able to keep pretty good. I'm not able to keep some of this area good because they're not my bees or not people who follow the same thing as me. But it doesn't seem to matter. Um, <clears throat> we get away with it. Um, and what I do in the spring um, is I tend to, there's 10 in that picture, but I overwinter 12 on the site. And then I'm free to take away any that I don't like the look of or don't like the temper of. And I'll leave perhaps, eight, perhaps the eight best that I'm very happy with their strain, I'm very happy with their temper, and they've come through the winter nicely, and everything's good about them. And I can rely on those, got competition there, I can rely on those to put out good drones. So then I've got three or four of these apries around in this area, and other people have got bees. I haven't got so much control over them, but I'm satisfied they're, they're native types as well. If I find any that aren't very good, and that are mine, I take them out of the area, I take them further afield, out to here somewhere, I put them outside. And I've got, so I haven't got just black bees by any means, but I try and keep one area good. Also, I don't mind not just having black bees, because then I can compare their performance with the hybridised performance and see if mine are as good or better. And um, I'm very happy with them. Does it work? Well, uh, performance. Now, this is where there's no... I haven't got much science backing me up. But I'm happy with the temper, generally. Really good to handle. The bee inspectors came and went through all of them this summer. Everyone, over about 150 colonies or something. And they were pretty happy. They were quite pleased with the temper. They're not all perfect. And they're not, not all ones I'd breed from, because I like to breed from the very most docile ones. Um, but they're generally good. Uh, the brood pattern is generally good, especially of the breeders. I select ones that have got a nice, solid brood. The health has improved dramatically. Uh, I haven't got a problem with chalk brood. We'd see one or two cases here and there, but uh, not like it was. I am seeing a lot of sack brood at the moment, uh, far more than I'd like to see. Uh, I don't know why, but the bee inspectors say they've seen a hell of a lot of it this year, so I don't know. Swarming, they're getting better. I could rely on practically every colony swarming every year when I started, but now um, I'm definitely getting ones that don't, and I'm breeding from ones that don't swarm in. And purity of strain, well, and I'm doing this rough and ready method of judging them by their appearance. Are they consistently? I mark them. If they're mostly native looking, but I can see some yellow ones in there, yellow bands, I'd mark them down a little bit, four or three. And if they're all consistently the same, I give them five. That's pretty rough and ready, but I think it works. Um, I think the, probably the scientists could tell us more, but I think, um, it's uh, uh, recessive. The colour is recessive for native. As soon as a, a buckfast mates with them, the offspring goes yellow. And uh, so you can tell by looking at them that they're pretty pure if they're, if they're dark strain. I've heard one of people say to the contrary, so don't believe me. But anyway, we've had, I have had some DNA results done because someone near me who gets funding and, and tests our bees around Cornwall now and again, and it, it, oh, last year we sent seven away. And this is the sort of thing you get back. This is from Apigenics uh, in Switzerland who do the tests. And these are three examples. I give my breeder... I don't name all my bees by any means, but I give breeder queens a name rather than a number because then I know I can relate to that and we can relate to the offspring. So this was Bluebell at the top. And they were 90 to 100% native. And the mother's line was native. <laughs> So we're really happy with that. They, in this method, they consider anything over 90% as pure strain. Uh, this one is called Kim 2. 
I sold some bees to a lady called Kim, and then I got some back from her because they were so nice. And uh, we bred from these. And two means that we've, we bred from Kim one, and then we, there's some good offspring, and I bred from another one in the next generation. So you can see the generations that keep going. And that same, that was a good one. This one was Blackberry 2. We're on Blackberry 3 now. Black, we bred a lot from Blackberry 3. Uh, so next year, I hope there'll be some Blackberry 4s. That's a line which has gone really well and a really lovely bee. And they came out pure as well. Anyway, there were seven altogether. So uh, five came out 90 to 100%. So we're very delighted with that, obviously. Two weren't, weren't so good, weren't so impressive, but they're, they're basically native, but there's a lot more mixture in them. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you can get. Now, if you want to know more about how I've done it, or how we're going about it, you can go and buy the book, or you can even join Bibba if you're an enthusiast, some of you are probably members already. It's well worth supporting what, they, what they're trying to do. And I think, we want, I think we should take it much further. There's a lot of sympathy amongst beekeepers at the moment for, I'm not saying specifically for the native bee, but certainly people love local bees. And they, they, there's a feeling they don't want to keep introducing imports, which tend to muck up our systems. Um, DEFRA did a survey, some of you might have taken part in 2018. 80% of respondents said they would support a program, a bee improvement program with the native bee. That's pretty amazing. Because um, I know not many of us are in a great position, but we are actually, because we've all got local bees. And we, we've got somewhere, to, it's a start. We've got to start somewhere. <clears throat> if we could get something like that going, people would be on board with improving their local bee and forgetting about imported bees. <coughs> And basically, I think it worked like people who wanted to take part would they start by refraining from importing bees. They would um, keep record of all their colonies' performances. They'd work together in groups where possible. So you'd go probably through your local associations and uh, working with like-minded people. That's pretty important. It's hopeless if you've got a group that falls out with itself, uh, which happens a lot. Um, and you gradually develop a local strain based, well, based on whatever you like, really. But I prefer to base it on my native bee. Um, I think that's easiest. That's why I do it. I like, I'm all for, all for doing things the easy way. To summarise, beekeeping is crucial to world agriculture. We know that. It's got more and more important. Sustainable beekeeping is part of that. Bee improvement is relevant to all beekeepers. We should all be trying to improve our bees in some way. If it's just temper. The best route to hardy bees is to refrain from, refrain from imports and rear local. It's best if you can develop a local strain, which will give you more reliable, consistent population. Beekeepers need to cooperate in order to achieve success. Uh, national bee improvement program is something we could work towards so we can all improve the quality of our bees and discourage imports. And we've said about how we do it, and that is that. Uh, beekeepers, okay, a lot of beekeepers aren't going to be actively involved because we've got enough on our plate trying to keep two colonies going, perhaps. But we can be sympathetic to the idea and we can contribute to it by not importing by when we need it, if we need a new queen, getting it locally off perhaps the, perhaps the bee improvement group and that sort of thing. We can all be plugging into it, however much energy we've got. And some people will be much more active than others. That doesn't matter as long as we're all sympathetic to what's going on and taking a part. So that is that, I think. Thank you very much. So any questions, please? Yes, I'd be interested to know when you talked about looking for um, queens that, uh, well, colonies that didn't swarm in the first full year of the queen, whether you took any uh, anti-swarming uh, procedures or whether it just, it, you did it manage Spanish to eliminate it completely. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Did everyone hear that? It was quite hard to hear at the front here, but I did hear it just. <laughs> um, do I take any anti-swarming procedures? Yes. We, we go through our colonies every week. 
we check them over, we see which are rearing queen cells, and if they're rearing queen cells, that's a mark against them, really. So it's the ones that don't even attempt to rear a queen cell all season long. And as long as they're producing a good, strong colony, that's a big plus for us. If they're producing a feeble little colony and not swarming, that, that doesn't really count. But as long as it's a good, thriving colony and it doesn't swarm, doesn't attempt to swarm, it's the attempting to swarm that I'm, I'm marking, really. And uh, we try and control our bees so they don't swarm. Obviously, we lose some, but on the whole, we, we succeed in doing that. So uh, it's those that don't attempt to swarm that we're looking for. Uh, how long do your native queens live? Uh, the longest go for about four years. Um, I don't think we've seen a five-year one. We've had several four years, but um, I won't say they all go for that. Someone told me... There's a very good trait to select for is longevity. Because what you find is the ones that have gone for four years are the ones that did really well in their first and second year. They're very strong queens and they've produced a lot of brood and they're still going in their fourth year. And they're, they're, often they're not too bad even in their fourth year. So it's quite a good trait because those, that longevity, I do like to breed from ones that <coughs> have survived a long time because um, I think it is worth doing. I think it, it isn't just that they live for a long time, it is that they were good, and they still are good. Uh, they, they've got something, a good quality there. So I like to encourage that. Um, you mentioned uh, health as one of your selection criteria. Um, do you include in that varroa tolerance in any way? And um, whether you do or you don't, have you seen any improvement in varroa tolerance through your programme? It's a good question. And it's a very complicated question, uh, but we, uh, when we started, we thought, we're not, we've got to keep this simple, we're not going to do any varroa monitoring, etc., because of the work. I've gone back on that a little bit, um, and I, I do treat them minimally, if you like, but um, we, the last couple of years, we've now monitored the colonies, um, say, August, time to see what the drop is and we haven't treated the ones that are, that are, have got low drop so there are some uh, but there's so many factors in that if they swarmed and so on so I'm not quite sure but I one thing I feel I should do more of is just leaving some apiaries to their own devices now I haven't done or I so I have done it in the past a couple of times, and I've lost about <laughs> a very high percentage of my colonies. So it kind of sets you back for about two years when, they, when you do that. But I've been urged by quite a few, from quite a few sources not to treat my bees at all. And some people have had a, quite a lot of success with that. After initial losses, they seem to get over it, and away they go, and they don't treat. And I, I have a lot of sympathy for that. But at the moment, I haven't got, I'm not brave enough, because I, I can't face losing probably at least 50% of my colonies and then having to spend the next two years building up again. But I think there, I'm tempted to do it in certain apiaries. I probably st should stop treating some apiaries and see what we can get going. I think it'd be a well worthwhile thing to do. So my answer is I haven't done as much as I'd like to. I would like to do a lot more. Yes, I wanted to ask about the picture you put up of your dark queen. You talked about the worker bees as being native, but with that dark queen, she had very golden legs. Is that <laughs> something that is an yep. indication of a native bee? They, they quite often have red, what I call red legs. It's, uh, um, and I did do wonder about the, whether they, they need to look like that. When I was in Finland at the SICAM conference, that's the European Dark Bee Conference last year, the Polish contingent, they, they've got an area which they breed native bees in, at the same subspecies as us. And, uh, yeah, she's got lighter coloured legs, yeah. Um, they put up one which was very banded. And I always questioned my... I've got some that are very banded. And I always thought, well, they don't look like that. And perhaps they're not native, or perhaps they're a bit mixed. But they said, no, they're perfectly OK. So I think there is variation, certainly, within the Queen. So I don't think there's any one particular look that is right, if you know what I mean. 
But um, any thoughts, Roger? Well, I was just thinking, Joe, if they've got yellow legs, they're probably ocean hornets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Roger. <laughs> uh, it, 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 in answer to your question, um, uh, personally, I don't think there's any um, any relevance to it because I've I've seen pure native uh, queens, and they are actually quite variable. Yeah. For your breeding, you're using grafting, presumably, are you? Yeah. Is there any scope in a smaller beekeeper using? other techniques like uh, demery or using swarm cells? Absolutely. Uh, did you all hear that? I, I do. Right, he's asking about our queen rearing techniques. Do we do grafting? And is there any scope for other methods? There's definitely scope for other methods. Um, I do grafting, he says proudly. I don't actually. I, I let my apprentice do all the grafting now. She is twice as good as me at grafting. And so she does all the grafting now. And it's a very simple technique once you get the hang of it. She got into it very easily. And uh, it's great. We like it because it's kind of spontaneous. She can say, right, we'll breathe from that one. Just go in there and grab what you want. Uh, you can use um, those cup kits and stuff like that. They're fine. There's umpteen different methods which are all as valid as each other. Whatever suits you is the answer. And you don't have to do anything. You've just got to find what works and what's easiest for you. And uh, it could be something very simple. Roger has covered a lot of these techniques on his talks around the country. But yeah, I think whatever you can find that works that you like, basically, is the answer. <laughs>